So another thing about New Mountain Church is that we're expository. That means we go verse by verse through different books of the Bible, whichever you know, book we choose to go through. Uh, so we're, we've been going through Luke for a long time, and right now, today, we're in Luke 13. So let's pull out our Bibles. Everybody got Bibles? Holy cell phones? Ancient scrolls? Stone tablets? Nothing? Okay. If you don't have a Bible, there's Bibles back there. Foster will hook you up. He'll give you a Bible. Uh, just so that you got one, because God's Word is what should be in your lap, not Facebook, not a puzzle or uh, some kind of a game, Monopoly or Clue in your lap. This is church. We should have the Bible in our lap. So let's do this. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word. This is Luke 13, and we'll start at verse 10. Luke 13, starting at verse 10. It says this, Now he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites! Does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from from this bond on the Sabbath day? And as, as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. Lord, we thank you so much for service today. Lord, we thank you for the word that we're going through today. Lord, help us to apply your word to our life. Help us, Lord, to understand your word. Uh, We want to know you deeper, Lord, and, and Lord, many of us need to have healing and deliverance. Many of us need to have a fresh start and a uh, a brand new day. So, Lord, help us with that. Be with us today, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, maybe seated. Maybe seated. I want to tell you a story about where I'm from, I'm from southeast Arizona. I was born in uh, Fort Huachuca, Arizona, lived in Bisbee, Arizona. My dad was from Douglas, Arizona. Uh, that's where my mom grew up as well. Well, my grandparents and my aunt was in Douglas, Arizona forever. And so we'd always go down there for family, you know, family trips. We'd go down there a few times a year. Uh, and so I, I viewed southeast uh, Arizona as also my home. You know, that's where I came from. That's where my family's at. In fact, that's where my, my mom and my, my dad and, and uh, my brothers even are all in Sierra Vista, Arizona right now. And I think about like the times of going down there in the family van and you know, staying with the grandparents. Uh, there was something that happened in the 90s. And it was pretty crazy because it was like worldwide news, but it was in Douglas, Arizona. Like nothing worldwide happens in Douglas, Arizona. Um, but what ends up happening is there's a man that, that, that goes down there and he, he buys a factory, like a, a, a regular, like smaller, you know, industrial building factory type thing. But then he goes across the border into Agua Prieta, Mexico, and buys a nice big plot of land and builds a house on it. And it seems like legit, that's okay, a lot of people do that. Well, as they were building the house, they noticed that they, 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 they dug the hole for the pool, and, uh, and so construction you know, keeps going, the foundation gets laid and that kind of stuff. But they kept noticing that the, the pool kept getting filled again with dirt. <laughs> And then it'd get emptied, and then it'd get filled again with dirt. And they were wondering, you know, the, the townspeople are wondering, what's going on over here? What's going on? And f- f- so finally the house is built, everything's done, and uh, everything just seems like regular day-to-day operations. There's the concrete plant across this, the border in Douglas, and there's this nice large house in Agua Prieta, and everybody's going about their business like everything's normal going to and fro, going to work, going to the grocery market. Everything's just normal, right? No, it's not. For six months, there was a tunnel leading from the industrial factory to the house. 
that was trafficking thousands and thousands of pounds of cocaine. It was 270 feet from the factory to the house, underground, 20-something feet underground, trafficking thousands of pounds of cocaine for six months. And there's a road, you know, right on top of it, cars driving by all day long. Hunky-dory, everything's okay. I got some pictures of the tunnel. That's the, that's the inside of the tunnel. The next picture shows a very inconspicuous uh, little hose spigot right there in the ground, little faucet you can turn on for your sprinklers, right? Looks normal, looks like everything's okay, except for that is not for the sprinklers. You turn that, and it goes to the next picture, which opens up the floor underneath where the pool table was, and that was the entrance into the tunnel. We think about this happening right underneath the feet of the Douglas people. Six months, and nobody knew any different. They got tipped off by an informant. That's the only way, only way they found out. <laughs> There's a quote from one of the U.S. Customs guys. He says this, Just the complexity to this whole tunnel was something that had been unseen before. This guy's a U.S. Customs agent. He says he, w- he was there on the night that uh, it, was, it was raided, and he helped with the investigation. He says this in his next quote, And no one, I think, in the United States government, especially in law enforcement, realized anything like this ever existed. You might be asking, Jeremy, what are you talking about? Why are you bringing this up? The reason I'm bringing this up is because some, Christ- some Christians do, do not know the truth that is happening in the unseen realm right in front of them right underneath their feet, so to speak. We're all going about our business thinking that there's nothing spiritual happening all around us. And it's a lie. You're being fooled. There are spiritual things happening all around us. There is a war going on spiritually all around us. But so many Christians today are just walking about their day-to-day like nothing's wrong. As long as they get to Starbucks or Dutch Bros, they're all good. Everything's good. They don't need to think about eternity. They don't need to think about uh, the things of God. They don't need to think about their spirit. They don't need to think about uh, the war that we're in as Christians. Ephesians 6 talks about the armor of God. Most Christians have probably heard that that verse, that section of Scripture before. right? Put on the full armor of God. Uh, Now, that armor that you put on is to protect you from the evil one. It is because you're in a bad life. I say this almost every message. There is no sidelines to Christianity. You're in the battle or you're ran over by the battle. That is it. Those are the only two options in Christianity. And so today, I I want us to really look at this scripture with, with spiritual eyes. Be able to look at things in the unseen realm and be able to see what is going on all around us. You know, some Christians wonder if God is even in control because they see all these, the, these horrible things that happen in our world, right? And they wonder, how is, how is God even in control? Is Jesus even the way like he says he is? It's, it's understandable. John the Baptist was unsure at, at a time. John the Baptist was unsure about Jesus. And he asked his disciples to go to Jesus and say, are you the one or should we keep looking? says this in Luke 7, 21. This is, we been, went through this a long time ago, but it says, In that hour he healed many people of diseases and plagues and evil spirits. And on many who were blind he bestowed sight. And he answered them, he answers the disciples that come up from John. He answers them, Go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, the poor have good news preached to them. Jesus is the way, Jesus is the only way, and Jesus is the way that we can have uh, victory, that we can triumph over the evil one. It's because of Jesus. If we're on our own, it's not going to happen. If, if we're on our own, things like that drug tunnel in the spiritual realm are going to happen all the time. Got to ask this question. What was the number one ministry of Jesus? 
faith. The number one ministry that he did. Testified to the truth. truth. Yep, that's one. But what is the number one? Healing. Josh said healing. Think about what his ministry is. What is he doing? His ministry. I heard it right there. Who said it? Making disciples. That is the number one ministry that Jesus ever did. You might think, well, he preached. And he preached the truth. Yes, he completely did. And he did it with authority. But what did he do every day, day in, day out, every night? He was with his disciples. That was his number one ministry, discipling. You notice that discipling didn't just happen on a day, like Sunday. It didn't just happen on a weeknight, like your Bible study. Discipleship was an ongoing life living thing that took place sure jesus did preach with authority that was his number two for sure number three might have been his healing and his casting out of demons but number one was his discipleship that was the most important thing that he did and that's why when i look at the model that jesus has presented to the church for how the church should operate it needs to operate in a discipleship style manner It needs to operate as a group of believers that come together. And that's why before our first service as New Mountain Church, I already instated elders. In fact, the ancient church, that's how they operated. They were a group of believers that came together, and there was a group of men in that that group that had the responsibility of God to lead the people. I just think about how important it is to be a part of a church. How important it is to be a part of a gathering, of a fellowship, to know each other. I'd like to, I'd like to challenge you today. If you only know a little pocket of people in this church, I dare you to meet somebody new and remember their name. <laughs> don't, don't pull what I pull sometimes. Oh, hey, how's it going, guy? What's up, dude? No, actually, take the time to remember somebody's name, a new person that you don't know. I dare you. I challenge you. Challenge accepted? Okay. Okay. Let's keep going. Luke 13, 10 through 11 says, Now he was teaching on, or he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully strengthen herself. I've, I've met a guy like this before. I've been preaching at the mission for, uh, I think, almost 12 years now, and uh, at the chapel that happens there. Um, and there was a guy there for many years who could not straighten his back. Like, he was bent over, like, like seriously bent over. Uh, I was like, wow, that is, that is rough right there. And there's, you know, a medical thing that can happen where your spine eventually gets uh, calcified, and it, it, it kind of makes, makes you, you know, bend over like that. Um, but you've noticed that Jesus right here, he was teaching in one of the synagogues. That's something that he did often. He taught in the synagogues. And he was teaching there. And in that synagogue, there was a woman with a disabling spirit. And she had it for 18 years. That's a long time. But there's something that we've got to look at before we really keep going. Is what's the difference between synagogues and churches? What is the difference between a synagogue and a church? Now, a synagogue, the way that a synagogue would happen is that there had to be a certain amount of Jewish men in a town or a village to come together and create a synagogue. Uh, And a synagogue was a place of teaching. It was a place of prayer. It was a place where the Torah was taught. The law of Moses was taught. But what is the difference? Because we see synagogues in Scripture. We even see Jesus preaching in, in synagogues. I think some churches in America, Jesus wouldn't even be welcome in the door. (laughs) That's crazy. Uh, uh, But Jesus was even teaching in these synagogues. So what is the difference between a synagogue and a church? Separated by gender, gender, that is true. Although I do know some Christian churches that do the same thing, unfortunately. It's not right, not biblical, but... Yeah, teaches old school stuff. Yeah, kind of. The synagogue was 
teaching scripture, they're praying, they're meeting together, they're doing all that, but what they were missing is the most important component, Jesus. They're missing the Messiah because they're waiting for the Messiah, but when the, when the Messiah is standing at their pulpit and preaching, they miss it. Now you think about this. Well, what if there were some Jewish people in that synagogue that heard Jesus and believed in him? At that moment, they would become a follower of the way. They would no longer be in Judaism. That is the difference. That is the difference between a synagogue and a church. A synagogue has the right biblical Torah and the law of Moses, the prophets. They have that and they're praying together, but they're missing the most important component. And that's why I believe that there's churches today it sounds like I'm ragging on churches today. I'm not ragging on churches, but listen to me. There is, there are churches today that have a huge emphasis on tradition, or they have a huge emphasis on worship. They have a huge emphasis on, on, on different things, but they're missing Jesus. And they're off because of that. It's not right. It's not operating correctly because of that. If they're missing Jesus, they're in error. In fact, in the Revelation, the book of Revelation, there's one of the churches that gets a letter from Jesus, Ephesus. And this church, Ephesus, he gets a letter from Jesus saying that you've done great things. You've been teaching good things. You've been doing all the right things that you should be doing, except you've lost your first love. See, if we don't have Jesus, we can be right about every single thing other than that. But if we're missing the component of Jesus, we're missing everything. We're missing the whole picture. So you say, well, how could that woman have a demon in her or, or be bound by Satan? Or how could she have this infirmity? How can she be in bondage like she is, but yet in church all that time? Because there was the component of Jesus missing. And that's why today, the way to be freed from the bondage of sin and the way to be freed from the attacks of the enemy is not by anything that you do. It is only by the work of Jesus in your life and the guidance and operation of the Spirit in your heart. That is it. That is the way that this happens. I can't... I can't express how, how bad it is to overlook Jesus. You've got to ask this question. Can, can you be a Christian and overlook Jesus? Is that possible? See, I've been preaching from this pulpit for a long time already uh, the same message, which is we cannot be comfortable couch potato Christians. We can't be relaxed in our effortlessness as Christians. We have to be showing the fruits of the Spirit. There's only a few ways to know if, if a person believes or not, by the way. One of them is that they persevere to the end. The second one is that they're producing fruit, fruit of the Spirit. We talked about that last week, fruit of the Spirit. Was that last week or was that the Bible study? They get mixed up in my head. I don't even know. Yeah, last week, yeah. The fruit of the Spirit is love. Coming from love is patience, uh, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control, all that. And this, that's all coming from this love that we have, but it's that fruit that is being produced in our life. Again, if you're a Christian, but there is no fruit. If you're a Christian, but you smell like the world. If you're a Christian, but you, you have no love for Christ, you don't want to come to church, there is something missing. There is a component that's absent. What is it? most likely Jesus. It's most likely Jesus. She's had this disabling spirit for a long time, 18 years. You know, uh, Adam Clark, he was an old school Methodist preacher from back in the day. He says this, a situation equally painful and humiliating, the violence of which she could not support and the shame of which she could not conceal. She was visibly beat up and bound by the devil. She couldn't hide it, even though so many of us can hide it. So many of us can keep it under wraps and nobody knows the struggle we're going through. She couldn't hide it. It was evident. 
C.H. Spurgeon, preacher from London back in the 1800s, says this, For 18 years she had not gazed upon the sun. For 18 years no star of night had gladdened her eye. Her face was drawn downwards towards the dust, and all the light of her life was dim. She walked about as if she was searching for a grave, and I do not doubt she often felt that it would have been gladness to have found one. When we look at the people in our communities, when we look at the people in this world that are in bondage to sin and the devil, does it affect us? Does it like hurt our heart to see somebody like that? Or do we just keep on walking? Keep on moving, turn the eye, keep on walking because we don't want to be stopped. We don't want to be interrupted in life. She had a disabling spirit. So this is the section where I want to look at what it would be with demons and dark angels. What would that look like? How does that happen? Um, This is the simplest way that in my studies I've found is that demons are a type of spiritual parasite. They search and roam trying to find somewhere that they can fit in, somewhere that they can consume a person and, and, and take up residence inside of a person. A demon is is definitely a dark spirit, but this is a type that needs to have a place to rest, needs to have a place to come in and infiltrate. A dark angel is something much different. Now, a dark angel is someone that has, has put their allegiance towards Satan. If we look through Scripture, we see that Satan was cast out of heaven for the sin of pride, that Satan wanted to be like God. He wanted to usurp authority and be like God. And God has kicked him out of heaven. But not before he was able to persuade what looks like maybe a third of the angels to follow him. And they were all cast down to the earth. Now, the dark angels, they take up residence in what Paul calls principalities, powers, strongholds, this, this darkness that comes to our world, it's pulling the strings. Where a demon is what would most likely come from the unholy act of these dark angels with women. That's what has created the Nephilim tribe, if you, if you know your scriptures, the Nephilim tribe. These Nephilim tribes that die, they're wandering spirits is what are the demons, most likely. That's a debated topic, but No matter what, they're both bad. No matter what, they both want to destroy you. Uh, But no matter what, God is more powerful than anything. God is more powerful than all the dark angels and demons put together. God is the orchestrator of the universe. He is the power in control. God is the one who is our protector and our deliverer. But it comes down to this. We are attacked as Christians. Some of us might feel the compelling voice in our ear telling us, oh, you're no good. Nobody likes you. You can't do this. You're going to get found out about this. You're going to totally ruin your life. Just these voices that we we have in our head. Uh, Sometimes it it is spiritual battles that that we're dealing with. But then for many people in this world, they're not only attacked from the outside, but they're attacked from the inside. I remember at the, at the mission a few years back, I used to always go, this was, this was before COVID, but it, I did it during COVID anyway, so it don't matter. Uh, I used to always go up and say, God bless you, and you know, put my hand on these guys' shoulders that are at the mission. You know? And uh, you know, most, all the, uh, most all the time it was like, uh, oh, thank you, oh, God bless you, you know, just nice stuff. I put my hand on one guy, and I could have felt you know, 220 go through my hand, and he jumped up as fast as he could and ran out the door and i said i said god bless you and i touched him you know what i mean there's so many times where there is something happening beneath the surface right in front of our eyes but again if we're christians that only do church on sunday and that's it the rest of the week is mine the rest of the week is for me then we are going to be blind to this and we're not going to be much help in spiritual things. But if we're strong, active Christians, 
we're going to discern the spirits. We're going to be able to see when there's something wrong right in front of us. And that's when we either pop into action or we don't. That's when we either stand up in bravery or we lay down in cowardice. Those are our options. The Spirit of God in the believer brings bravery, brings conviction, brings uh, even the ability to do certain things. There's so many times I walk into a situation and I have no idea what I'm going to say and I'm pretty sure I'm going to mess everything up and I say, God, help me. And then I just start to deal with what's ever in front of me. And guess what? He helps me. He helps me. He helps me through it. He helps me get through things. He helps me overcome things. He helps me to, 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 to fight off the attacks of the enemy. He helps me to block myself and defend myself from the whispers of the enemy. And for everybody, that freedom is available if we let it. That freedom is available. For the believer, we can be demonized. We cannot be demon-possessed. It's an impossibility. But unfortunately, there's many people in this world that think that they are a Christian. Because they prayed a prayer one time. They think that they're a Christian because they marked it on a card one time. They think that they're a Christian because they even got baptized. But in no way are they a believer. And unfortunately, I think that there's going to be people that hear the most horrendous words at the last moment of their life. Depart from me, for I never knew you. They've missed the component of Jesus their whole life. That's why Dan came up with this phrase, and I love this phrase, that a true believer is a born-again, spirit-filled follower of Jesus Christ to where you are no longer who you used to be. I mean, sure, you have the memories of it. Sure, you have the, the past that is still with you, but you are a new creation in Christ all things are new. All things are wide open. And the Spirit is guiding you through all things. And at that moment, it says that the Spirit of God indwells us and seals us and that light cannot exist with darkness. We have the deliverance of all deliverances when we truly are born again into Christian, in, into Christian belief and, and, and following Jesus. That's the difference. It's being a true Christian versus a nominal Christian. It's being a a seven-day-a-week, 24-hour-a-day Christian rather than being a Sunday morning at 10.30 a.m. Christian. (laughs) We do have a battle to fight. I hope that we wake up and we see that it's happening right in front of us. I hope that we would start to move in the power that he's provided for us. Luke 13, 12 through 13 says, And when Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hand on her, and immediately she was made straight. And she glorified God. This is where it comes down to healing and deliverance. Healing and deliverance. Jesus saw this lady in the synagogue as he was preaching. Most likely he stopped preaching. And he sees her over there in the corner. And you're right, they were segregated. She was over on the right-hand side, probably towards the back with a disability. He stops what he's doing. Woman, you are freed from your disability. You might say, well, well she didn't mark a card. She didn't raise her hand. She didn't come forward to the altar. The most important thing to know is that Jesus saw her. And Jesus called her. There's so many times we think, Oh, me? My name is Josh Johnson. I've made the most important decision in my life. The most greatest decision I have ever made to believe in Jesus. 
Well, I do believe that you do believe in Jesus. You do you know, make the decision to believe in Jesus. But I don't think that it happens before he sees you and he calls you. And what happens is freedom. For this lady, freedom. It says, immediately she was made straight. Now, when Jesus heals in Scripture, it doesn't always happen the same way. And I think that that's important. You know why? Because us as humans, especially us as Christian humans, we want to have everything nice and easy, nice and straight. It always happens this way. It's never going to happen another way. It's only going to happen this. It's only going to look like this. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not. I mean, Jesus spit in a guy's eye one time, and he healed, he healed his eye. Like, I am never going to do that. I saw a pastor do that one time, and that was the grossest thing I've ever seen in my life. I think only Jesus is allowed to do that, okay? But it happens different ways, but immediately she's healed. Immediately she's healed. But what does she do? Does she go on and just continue her life? She glorifies God. I probably would believe that she glorifies God forever. Becoming born again. Following the Jesus of the way. She's following the truth. There's so many times that this happens in Scripture. There's so many times where, where people come to the truth and knowledge of Jesus. In fact, both Nicodemus in Scripture and jo Joseph of Arimathea, we talked about them during, during a Resurrection Sunday, right? Joseph of Arimathea, he gave his tomb to Jesus to be buried, right? He asks for Jesus' body, brings Jesus down to be buried. Nicodemus, he's wondering and contemplating about who Jesus is, and he comes to Jesus at night while Jesus was still alive and, and talks to Jesus. Both these guys seem to have really clung on to Jesus, really understood the component of Jesus. But we don't ever hear about them ever again in Scripture. Did you know we don't hear about them ever again, even in Jewish writings? Did you know that most likely believing and trusting and following Jesus cost them everything? Cost them their standing as a Pharisee. Cost them even maybe their lives. But I guarantee you talk to them today in glory and it was the best decision they ever made. They are born again. It says this in John 3, 1 through 3. Now there was a man of the Pharisee named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God. Look at that. They see Jesus. They know he comes from God. For no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. And Jesus answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And this is where Nicodemus, he totally didn't get it. He's like, what do you mean? Do I have to go backwards in my... No, stop, Nicodemus. Come on. Spiritually, you need to be born again. You, you need to have a rebirth. You can't be your old... You're no longer your old guy. You're born brand new. In John 10, 24 through 28, it says this. So the Jews gathered around him and said to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. And Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name bear witness about me, but you do not believe. Now listen, listen to this, people. You do not believe because you are not among my sheep. Verse 27 says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish. Listen, listen. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. This is the good news. This is the good news. Is that we are protected as believers, but we have to be believers. You're a nominal Christian, you're not at all protected. You're a nominal Christian, you are under the attack of the enemy, and you could even be possessed by a demon. Born again believer, we're sealed. Nobody can snatch us out of his hand. But, but you have to hear his voice. 
Did you know that this happened back in the ancient day where shepherds would come into a large town and they would pay the guy sitting on the wall to watch the sheep of all the shepherds, right? He, that was his job, you know. He probably has a little straw in his mouth, you know. And he's watching everybody's sheep. Then there's multiple shepherds coming into these villages. And everybody's sheep gets put into the same corral. And you think, how in the world does that happen? You know, all the guy on the wall is doing is he's just watching, making sure nobody steals. But how do you get your sheep back? Well, you go and you pay the boy that's sitting on the wall and you open the door and you as a shepherd call your sheep. And what did the sheep do? They hear their master's voice and they come. Not all the sheep, only the shepherd's sheep. It comes down to that. Either in Christianity you hear and respond or you don't. There is no middle ground. That's what I'm trying to say. And I think that in, in America, there's been painted a middle ground that you can be in. Oh, don't be too religious. Oh, you're not that kind of a Christian, are you? Yeah, yeah I am. I am. I, am. I, I, I think that there's, there's so much more in following Jesus than most people really even realize. They just think that Jesus is there as their, their, their spiritual, you know, teddy bear when they're sad. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> when they need comfort. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> but did you know that Jesus is operating in your life in every aspect? Did you know that your marriage can be awesome because of Jesus? Did you know that, that what you do in life can be awesome because of Jesus? But it, it comes in truly jumping in all the way. I remember as a kid, I grew up there in the manors over off 24th Street. And every day during the summer, we used to go to the Kennedy swimming pool. And every day during the summer, I tried to get up the courage to jump off the high dive. Every time. And then the lights would start getting dark. And then the, the pool people would kick us out. And I'd go home. <laughs> and then school starting the very next Monday, and I'm there, and it's my last opportunity. <laughs> and I did the biggest belly flop you could ever do. <laughs> hey, but listen, I did it. I jumped off. I jumped off. I, I wonder, could we be living a life where we're playing it safe and summer's passing us by? You know what? In ministry, you might belly flop. Good. Guess what you learned from that? To not do it again that way. <laughs> Maybe get a little bit better, you know, diving instructions. But I hope that this could be a time, a message maybe that would help us uh, to hear his voice and to then follow our shepherd, follow Jesus. So it says, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Who's the my? Jesus, okay? Jesus, right? Does anybody have a coin? Anybody have a coin in their pocket? Yeah. You got one? Yeah. Let, Matt, I need you. I always need you, Matt. I need you to, to, right now. Matt's going to be Jesus Christ, okay? <laughs> He's got the beard for it. <laughs> you don't got a robe and sandals, but it's all right. <laughs> so if no one can snatch us out of the hand of Jesus, then, then close your hand around that coin. If I try to get in there, like, you can, you can probably keep me out, right? Well, it, it keeps going, though. It says this in John 10, 29-30. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. Ashley, I need you now. <laughs> Ashley's going to be the Father. <laughs> now, if Ashley had her hand even around Jesus' hand... Do you really think I'm getting in there? I'm not helping much. You're not helping much, but, it's, but you get the idea, right? All right, thank you guys. Thank you. I appreciate it. You get the idea. The, this, we are in the hand of Jesus, which is in the hand of the Father. But yet we really think that the enemy is going to get us? We really think that we're going to be destroyed from the enemy? 
the enemy does come to steal, kill, and destroy. It says that. And he does destroy many people. And he does kill many people. For the Christian, though, he steals from us. That's what he does. He steals from us our opportunities. He steals from us our relationships. He steals from us our time. But he doesn't kill us. He doesn't destroy us. And the more we walk in victory, the more we will be putting him down. We will be casting him out. We will be defending against darkness. The more we trust and follow Jesus. Evil tries to take us, but can't. It says she was healed immediately, and she praised God. Luke 13, 14 says, But the ruler of the synagogue, uh-oh, the ruler of the synagogue, indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, There are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed, and not on the Sabbath day. Wow. Oh, when we look at some, somebody like this, this ruler of this synagogue, right? He was upset. Jesus did something out of the ordinary. Jesus did something that was most needed, but it didn't fit with the service. It didn't fit with their belief, their tradition. You've got to understand that back in these days, the Jewish rabbis would have looked at exorcism because essentially that's what happened this lady had the spirit on her and jesus later calls it the spirit of satan that had bound her for 18 years the jewish people would have looked at what needed to happen to that lady as a job as a work almost like physicians or, or nurses you think about these jobs out there nurse practitioner uh, psychiatrist, doctor, surgeon, all these different, you know, different professions. They're work. They're all a, a job. They're all something that happens. And they would look at exorcism as, a, a, and casting out an evil spirit as work. And you do not work on the Sabbath. But Jesus, no, 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 no. Jesus, he, he, was, he, was, he was really going to help them understand the truth. He was going to understand the truth where he says this, Luke 13, 15. Then the Lord answered him, You hypocrites! Do not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? There was a, there was a clause, there was a loophole in the Jewish belief that you could do that to your ox or your donkey, but yet a woman who for eight years has been bound by Satan no 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 we can't we can't do that no 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 we can't help her no 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 we can't break our tradition I, I wonder I wonder if things like this even today happen where we try to look for that loophole we try to look for that way out if being somebody that can help this lady was a profession then they're getting it all wrong See, God brings healing. God brings victory. God brings freedom. He does. And it's not a job. It's not something that, it's not something that, that you have to do. And that's why I, I, I think that everybody wants a one, two, three, four, five step way on how to do this or that in ministry. I don't know how many times I've looked on the internet at different ministry you know things theological things where they give you step and different steps of how to do something i'm like well i mean that's cool maybe it's going to help some people but but technically all healing all freedom all preaching all prayer all that kind of stuff is is coming from god anyways it's all coming from god anyways even if he's using us for a time and a place and a purpose that's great but it's all coming from god anyways but this synagogue ruler he was more concerned being able to bring his ox to the water than he was healing this poor woman of an evil spirit i think even today we're so much more inclined to take care of the whales than people right 
take care of the forests rather than people. And I think you should take care of the forests. I think you should take care of the whales. Uh, but I think people are of the most importance. And unfortunately, for many, many years in our country, it's been people who have died in the wombs of mothers. Countless. Countless. Where there's such an emphasis on animals and such a de-emphasis on tiny humans. That's a, good, that's a good way to put it. I think about this, you know, me and Amy, uh, a, a while back, uh, when I was working at the Vertical Church, I worked there for a decade, and so I, at a decade, they gave you a sabbatical to take. And so we took a sabbatical, and we ended up going to Hawaii, and as I was, we get to Hawaii, get off the plane, we go, we get a car, we take the car, we go straight to a beach, and the first beach we get to, I walk under the beach, and there is a turtle all dried up <laughs> on the sand. And I come from Arizona. I'm thinking, oh, no. Oh, no, this poor turtle. He needs me to save him. He's dried out. He's going to die. And I start, and I go to start picking up this turtle, and this lady comes out, stop. I'm from the Save the Turtles Foundation. And I guess, you know, I, I didn't know this, but turtles like to go up onto the beach and just dry out and like sunbathe, you know. And then when they're done, they just, you know, flop back into the water. But I thought he was dying, you know. But this lady was upset and she was ready to like hang me for, for the audacity of touching a turtle. Okay. Luke 13, 16 says, and ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? This lady, again, is extremely important to Jesus. Did you know that you are important to Jesus? It says this um, in the next verse, 13, 17. And he said these things, and all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. Now, I don't know if this was the reaction continually of them. Were they continually rejoicing and following Jesus? I don't know. But they were right then. And anybody who experienced Jesus in a deep way would not only rejoice on Sunday, but follow him seven days a week. And so I, I hope that that's you today. I hope that you're not like the religious leaders in the synagogue that were put to shame, but I hope that you join in the believers and rejoice in Him. I hope so. I'm going to call the band up. And while they're getting ready, I want, us to, I want us to pray. And in this prayer, this prayer is going to be a little bit different. In this prayer, it's going to be formatted a different way. Where if you want to trust Christ, I'll help a little bit with that prayer, but it needs to be a lifestyle thing. But, but, but what's going to happen after that prayer is, is I, want to, I want you to repeat after me and renounce things. Renounce past burdens, past demonic strongholds, past experiences. And so I'm going to pray for for your salvation. But then after that, I'm going to call you to repeat after me. So be ready for that. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much, Lord. We thank you for your work in our lives. God, help us today. Help us today to be more tightly knit to you. Help us to follow you more closely. Be with us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that people in here would put their faith and trust in you. I pray that you'd bring them freedom, bring them out of bondage. In Jesus' name. Now repeat this after me. Lord, I give my life to you. And I will follow you for the rest of my days. Lord, I renounce my anger. I renounce any witchcraft in my past. I renounce any sexual immorality in my past. 
and I hold on to your forgiveness and your mercy. Use me in mighty ways for the rest of my days. Amen.